What's going on guys? Thanks for tuning in. I got a very special interview with the Warfighters here. We have Staff Sergeant Tilly, United States Army. He was a LERP or Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol member in Vietnam. And uh, he just happens to be the uncle of our good buddy John with UW Gear, also at Alpha Charlie Concepts on YouTube. Be sure to check him out. But uh, Staff Sergeant Tilly, yep. thank you for the honor. Thank you. And uh, sharing your story with us. So if you could just Let's go back in time, and uh, what made you want to join the Army? Well, I went in the Army mainly because we had a lot of family problems. Uh, it was my way of getting away from it. I uh, went in the Army at, when I was 17. And what year was this? It, 1965, August, and took my basic and advanced infantry training at Fort Gordon, Georgia. At that time, I had orders for Vietnam, for the first air cab. But Congress passed a law saying no one under 18 in Vietnam. So I went to Fort Lewis, Washington with the 4th Infantry Division instead. Now the 4th was preparing to move to Vietnam. And in July of 1966, we started loading on ships and we sailed out of South Tacoma Harbor for 19 days for Vietnam. I was a brand new private first class that day. And I was with Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 12th Infantry, with the 2nd Brigade, 4th Infantry Division. And I stayed with Charlie Company for eight months. And I went from private first class to staff sergeant during those eight months. I was a team leader, I was a squad leader, I was a platoon sergeant, and a couple of times mm -hmm. I was a uh, acting platoon leader on the advice of my first sergeant, which I really thought I had the best first sergeant ever in the Army, uh, he suggested I go into the LERPs. He said I was real good with very small teams. So I volunteered, went into the LERPs. When you go into the LERPs, you have to take two missions where you're being evaluated no matter what rank you are. So, so real world missions. Real, real missions. You're just getting thrown into the fray. And you are the lowest man on the team. And I was very fortunate to go with Sergeant, uh, Staff Sergeant Britt both times. Uh, we made contact the second mission we went out. And after that I became a team leader. Did you guys have, before you went off on those two initial missions... Say that again, I'm a little down. <laughs> before you guys went out on those two initial missions, did you do any rehearsals or anything like that to prep you for... Well, I didn't because I was a new guy. And this was a new unit that hadn't been long put together. So we still had a lot of planning as far as uh, putting together classes for new people, yeah. uh, especially in map reading, radio, and artillery, FO. Uh, I went out as a new guy. I'd never called in artillery or anything, and I could read a map. I'd been in contact a lot. I've, uh, but this was the smallest team I'd ever been out on. We went out in four and five man teams. We went all the way up to Cambodian border. We'd stay out five to six days. And a lot of that time, we didn't even have radio communication. Uh, they, uh, we had a uh, PRC-25, which was an AM radio, and it was line of sight. And in the mountains, if you got a mountain range in front of you, you have no... So, we had a lot of things to learn, and this was a learning experience. And some things worked, some things didn't. <laughs> and after those two missions, I was a team leader. I got to take out my own team. And I finished out my tour in Vietnam as a team leader and also extended six months and continued as a team leader with the same unit. And, uh, can, can you talk to us real quick? I know there's a lot of people that watch this that are very interested in the type of gear and weapons you guys carry. Can you just... Well, the LERPs, for one thing, it's a long-range recon. And the main purpose when we first started was intelligence. Now, everybody... The, the bad part about starting a unit was nobody, everybody belonged to different units. We had no T and T O and E structure. 
I belonged to Charlie Company, 1st to 12th. I got my mail and my pay from them. My weapon belonged to them. So, and the next guy might belong to another battalion. So, you bring all these people in, and all of them belong to a different unit on, in reality, working as a LERP. So we had to learn to work together. And I don't care who you are or where you are, if you play around in the enemy's backyard long enough, you'll, you'll get make contact. And the first missions were strictly volunteer um, intelligence. Try to find the enemy. Uh, we'd either call in airstrikes or artillery, or we would just write it down, mark trails, mark bunkers, and it was intelligence. Later, and the they decided to do Hawkeye missions where four or five men would go out and actually try to make contact with the enemy. Now that was a very bad thing because four <laughs> or five men can't put up a very strong fight with the enemy. But we did it. We used um, automatic ambushes with Claymore mines. We called in airstrikes. We called in um, helicopter gunships, uh, artillery. The second mission I ever went on, I had to call in artillery. I had never been trained to call in artillery. Is that right? And I was very fortunate to get an artillery unit that worked with me. And uh, they actually wrote an article up in the paper about it. They had 105s, 155s, 8 inch, and 175 firing all at the same time. They put a regular wall of steel around us. <laughs> and what they had done is a unit had called and not realizing that we were five men had ordered us to move into this little valley and work as a blocking force because they were pushing an enemy element. Well, five men isn't a very good blocking force. <laughs> but we made it. And we never had to fire around that day. That was the <clears throat> but you learn to work with people. The people we worked with were family. Uh, I might have been in charge. My decisions could uh, affect any one of them. But every man there, if something happened to me, could have took over. They knew the radio. They could. Have, they were expected to know math. They could call in artillery airstrikes. Uh, I had great men. Uh, good radio operator. If we got in contact. He didn't wait for me to get the radio. He already had it called in, had support coming by the time I got to him. Um, we carried M16s, or later we carried the CAR-15, which was an M16. We had the M79 grenade launcher. We'd carry uh, M72 laws. Uh, each man would carry a minimum of two Claymore mines. Five frag, four frags, one white phosphorus concussion grenade, and we'd each have five smoke rounds. Every man was required to carry an extra battery for the radio. That worked for the radio and also for our automatic ambushes. Um, we would carry anywhere from 20 to 30 magazines, 30 round magazines, fully loaded, and we'd carry enough ammo to load them again. Any man who wanted to carry a shotgun or anything else, he was welcome to do it, but he had to handle it. If there was no passing off ammo or if you couldn't carry it. Uh, we, it took five helicopters to put one team in. It took five helicopters to bring us out. So we worked real close with the pilots. We were very close friends. They were like family. We worked hand in hand with the Air Force. Uh, especially the uh, forward uh, fact pilot that would talk to us and talk to the jets. Uh, we had nothing but great respect for them. Uh, it was a mentally challenging, each, each mission was mentally challenging. Whether you made contact or not, the You were always 24 hours a day expecting something to happen within the next second. You could not let down. 
Uh, you had to have men that you could count on not to look, uh, just walk along looking. Everybody had to do their job. Um, you, you never ate at the same time. <clears throat> Two or three of you would eat, the others would guard. Uh, if you stopped to eat, eat somewhere at night, you didn't stay there that night. As soon as it got almost dark, you moved into a different location. Um, how, how would you carry all the all those magazines on you? Well, a lot of them was actually packed in my pack. Uh, we had bandoliers that that we had had made that we could put the magazines in. Plus, we had uh, pouches we could. So you had that plus your pack. Uh, you had dead cord uh, blasting caps. You'd make up your dead cord and blasting caps before you ever left base. Uh, so you could set up ambushes or blow something that needed to be blown up. Uh, I've had my pack shot up. I've had a canteen shot on my hip. Uh, uh, I've, I've been in a couple of air, uh, uh, helicopter crashes that were shot down. Uh, never got hurt. My last tour of Vietnam, I stepped on a landmine. Mm. Uh, I was part of uh, H Company 75th Rangers for a while. I was with the recon platoon for the 2nd uh, Battalion, 12th Cav. And um, so I know what it's like to lay in the jungle and not expect to get any help. But there was only five of us that day. Uh, I stepped on it. I was the least injured because I'd, it had a defective fuse and I'd walked about 10 feet away and I was bending over to go under a limb when it blew up. My pack caught most of it and then I got my back, legs, and buttocks. Yeah. Uh, one of my best friends was my guy uh, covering for me. He took it right in the face. He, he didn't make it. Uh, two other men were so badly injured, I didn't expect them to live at all. Uh, the only guy that wasn't injured was a brand new man, and that was his first mission in Vietnam. And he worked great. He drug us off into the bush, he put claymores all around us. I couldn't find my weapon, so he'd give me one of the other guys. I couldn't move, I couldn't stand up, I couldn't kneel. Uh, the only good thing about it was I had no pain uh, in my legs. And I got on the radio, was trying to call in for help, let them know that we'd uh, got in trouble. Uh, I couldn't get nobody. Well, what I didn't know was we were transmitting. We wasn't receiving. <laughs> so. That young man took off and went by himself through the jungle to get help, <clears throat> and that was his first mission. And he brought him back. Awesome. And um, at that time, if the enemy had came up on us, they could have probably killed us with a stick. Those two men that was I was left with were unable to fight, and I wasn't going to be able to put up much of a fight. But we made it out. We went to the hospital together. They were flown to Japan the next day, and I stayed there, went to Cameron Bay, got rehabilitated physically, and sent back out to the field, and I finished my tour. I probably, I don't know how many missions I ever pulled. I pulled a lot of missions with the 4th Division. I really enjoyed the 4th Division, and uh, as, as far as uh, friends and a lot of people thought we were crazy to go out in teams like that, but really the guys I went out with was overachievers. You couldn't go out if you were scared and everybody had a little fear in them, but you had to be able to control it. And it was an important job and they knew it and they went out and did it. Uh, I've called in F-4 Phantoms, uh, Sky Raiders, Puff the Magic Dragon, mm -hmm. um, gunships uh, many a time. But <clears throat> I, was, I was the youngest staff sergeant, at least that's what they said in the United States Army. 
I had spent 19 months in service and I was a staff sergeant. <laughs> and I had just turned 19 years old when I got it. I was an E-5 in January of 1967 and I made staff sergeant March the 29th of 1967. So I didn't have a whole lot of training as an NCO. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. I could do the job in Vietnam, but I found out that there was so much I did not understand when I came back from Vietnam as far as being a leader in civilian life that I had to catch up on. And I ran into a lot of <clears throat> problems with some people resenting the fact that I made E6 so fast. Uh, normally, under peacetime conditions, it would take around 10 years or so to make E6. I did it in 19 months. So a lot of the older guys really didn't like it. So I had to deal with that and still try to figure out all the things I needed to do and learn to be an NCO here in the States. And I was stationed at Fort Rucker, but most of my tours were always at Fort Lewis, so it seemed like I couldn't get away from there. <laughs> uh, John told me you, you had an incredible ability to run into North Vietnamese regulars. <laughs> well, I did. <laughs> and uh, some of the articles in the book there, um, out of, I think, the seven missions, I ran into them five times. Um, so how, how would you know if they were regulars versus vehicles? Well, very easy. Uh, we, we work mostly in the mountains right along the Cambodian border. There's no villages. Uh, occasionally we would find a Viet Cong, and most of them had American weapons. M2, M1 carbines, I, I collected those, M1 grams. Um, I, I found one carrying the old uh, Grease Gun 45, uh, <laughs> all American made. <clears throat> North Vietnamese, they were in North Vietnamese uniforms, they had their helmets on, they had the AK 47s. Uh, it was like looking at a puppy and a pit bulldog. You know which ones to <laughs> what? Well, what? What were their uniforms? What did they look like? Uh, a lot of their uniforms would be a dark green or even a black. The hats was like a safari hat with a star on it. Yeah. Uh, part of our job was we'd sit next to a trail and one man would count how many went by, another man would count what type of weapons they had, uh, if they had a full pack or not, if they had uh, haircuts or not. All that told you uh, something about the people. If they had a full pack, it meant they hadn't been long from a base camp. If they had a haircut, they hadn't been long from a base camp. Uh, whether they had crew served weapons. Uh, I was with the group that found the largest ammo dump ever found in Vietnam War, and that was the Rock Island East in Cambodia. They said there was enough weapons there to reinforce three infantry divisions of North Vietnam. And that wasn't counting food or medical stuff. And it was thousands and thousands of crates. Um, <clears throat> I, hope, I hope you guys called in some B-52s on that. Well, one. actually, <laughs> they uh, flew, uh, only had six guys guard, guarding the whole thing. Really? Yeah. They had 225, I think, vehicles. One of them was a Bobo. Figured that was officer. Uh, they had choppers come in and take out the ammo and the rice and everything. And then what they couldn't take out, they burnt. Um, I watched B-52 strikes from the air. Uh, I've, the first men we ever lost in Vietnam were uh, friendly fire. Uh, first time was 81 millimeter mortars hit our platoon and uh, killed six men. And not long after that, we were hit by 105 uh, howitzers 
um, hit our platoon and weapons platoon, knocked out most of the uh, mortar platoon. And I know what it's like to be hit by a bomb from the air. I've been on that receiving then, and I was always be, I was always able to walk away from it without injuries. A lot of my friends didn't. So I know what it is. I I, I know what the price of freedom in America has cost us. I feel fortunate I was able to walk away from it with the health I've got. A lot of my friends gave everything they had. Uh, I just don't know what to say. Uh, really, I, it wasn't just me. It was I may have made the decision, but always depended on my men if they had a, a suggestion, as long as it was given at the right time. In the middle of a battle, wasn't it? <clears throat> uh, I had a first sergeant that told me, "If Tom, when you get in a position, you don't know what decision to make." It's better to make the wrong one than to not make one at all. Because even with a wrong decision, some of you might live. If you don't do anything, you're all going to die. So you always have that. You never know if your decisions you're making is going to turn out right until you get flown out of there back into base camp. Um, you don't know which trail you're going to take, if it's going to be the right one or the wrong one. I wanted you to tell Brent one of your episodes. You remember, you, you've told me before a couple of times when you all found come up on those group that was laid back, chilling around the little area and... Well, I'll tell it, but I can't tell it all because... No, don't, don't tell it all. There's something, I, some parts of it. We came <laughs> upon 15 North Vietnamese and they had a little camp and they were just a talking and a carrying on. And we heard them and we snuck up on them. And we set out our claymores, hit them with claymores and ran in there and shooting the heck out of them and called in contact. Well, you can skip the details on that. <laughs> uh, normally when you call in contact, they, radio operator is really good, he's right on there, but this time there was a hesitation and family they came on, we got the artillery, we got, uh, got the helicopter was coming in to get us out and you got to be careful because that door gunner shooting and he's scared too so you don't want to run into his fire. We got on, we got flown out, instead of going to brigade where we normally would land, we landed at the ammo dump, I mean the uh, refueling and then we got off and a jeep came up there with an officer in it and he wanted to know who fired first. And I told him we did. And he said, uh, Sergeant Tilly, who fired first? And I said, we did. He said, Sergeant Tilly, this is a ceasefire. And I told him, you didn't tell us. <laughs> That goes back to that radio silence thing where they yeah. weren't in communications. Right. They told everybody, but they forgot to tell the alert units that were out there. <laughs> so it was mm. that kind of thing. We had a sniper one day kept pinning us down, so mm. everybody was wanting to know how to get her, get the sniper. Easiest way to do it, call in artillery, doing a 100 foot hanging explosion over him, blew him out of the tree. We got, we got the sniper. Ain't no sense in running out there, everybody trying to hunt him down. I mean, you, you, you learn to use your head out there, or you learn to die. Uh, best training in the world, you can still get killed. But uh, I had other team leaders that would be in contact at the same time my team was in contact. But I didn't have radio comm with brigade and they would be trying to handle 
their contact, call in artillery airstrike, and relay for me at the same time. And that, that I mean, that's just a nightmare. Oh yeah. I but that's imagine. what you did between teams. You covered for each other. <clears throat> uh, when we first started going out, it was not unusual to go outside of artillery range and radio range, and they would send up a helicopter or an airplane uh, four times a day to get reports from us. That is, if they could find us. And General Pierce, when he took over the 4th Division, said that wasn't going to happen no more. And it didn't, except on very few special occasions. Uh, he didn't think it was right to send someone out and expect them to live and be in contact and not have anyone checking on them but four times a day. Uh, in 1967, a SOG came, unit came over, Special Operations Group, and asked if uh, our alert unit would be willing to pull some missions inside of Cambodia. SOG had been Really, uh, they'd taken a lot of casualties in 1967, and we we all agreed we'd do it. They supplied us with our car weapons and a bunch of other stuff, and um, we had, we pulled some missions in Cambodia. The first mission was pulled by Sergeant Hawthorne, Staff Sergeant. He's the one that gave him the nickname as the Kid because he said I was younger than his daughter and I was <laughs> and uh, but we, we went in and out of Cambodia on a number of occasions. Uh, we operated around uh, the Tri area that was between Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam, mostly Cambodia and Vietnam. We operated around the Cambodian border which was the uh, separation from Cambodia and South Vietnam. So we were, we would be in the, as far as we could go in enemy territory and still be in Vietnam. Uh, we had rewards placed on our head uh, as long as uh, the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets, the uh, LERPs, and I, I'm not sure, but I believe the uh, Marine Recon all had rewards on their heads. If they could get a team or kill off a team, they would get, it was something like a thousand dollars to them, which was like winning the lottery to us because they got so little pay. They had special contact groups that would try to catch us once they found out we were in an area. Uh, SOG ran into those units a lot when they went into uh, Laos and Cambodia. Uh, we didn't run into them, or at least I don't think we did, but maybe a couple of times and we were fortunate enough to get away. But the North Vietnamese was pretty well organized. They were well trained. They may not have been the best educated, but they knew the jungle better. Uh, far better than we did. They wasn't there for one year and going home. They were there until the war was over. So we took them seriously. Uh, majority of our contacts and my uh, fighting was with the 4th, I mean with the uh, North Vietnamese. Uh, when I was with the Charlie Company, we had a on February 7th, 1967, we ran into a, we were in bunkers and when a reinforced regiment tried to take us as a company level, one of our men earned the Medal of Honor that day posthumously. Were, were you guys outside the fire base or were you No, inside? we were actually, the night before we moved into an area that we had once been in before and had caved in all the bunkers. And we dug the thing out, we got in. And during that night, one of the listening posts kept calling in saying he heard movement and voices. We had four po listening posts out, but he was the only one that called in. Well, come daylight, he stayed out and we, 
every day at daylight that we would send out a squad to sweep the area around the company to make sure no one had actually came in. And the squad went out there and was ambushed. <clears throat> and he stayed out there and would not come back in until the last wounded man was able to be brought in. And during the time that they were bringing, the rest of the squad was pulling their wounded out, no one thought to stop long enough to bring him in. And he was, he was killed. He had been told that he could pull back, but he wouldn't do it. He was laying down fire. And it, I hate to say it, but when they, it wasn't intentional, but they came all the way back. And uh, they set up a uh, crew serve machine gun and took him out. Uh, our company during Vietnam had, uh, our Charlie company did, had two Medal of Honor winners. Uh, I didn't know the other one. He was a sergeant. Uh, we fought all that day, and they tried to get reinforcement into us, but the helicopters couldn't land. The guys from another company was jumping, bailing out the helicopter to help us, but they were 10, 15 feet above ground, and they were breaking legs and springing, so they had to quit that. At the end of it, they found out it was a reinforced NBA regiment had tried to take us out. And I was a buck sergeant that day. At the end of the day, I was the only sergeant in the platoon. And our platoon leader had been wounded. And there was only 14 of us left out of the platoon. So it was a bad day. And then after we got new guys, we'd spent about two weeks, three weeks there, we flew out and the report was we were going to an area that they suspected another reinforced regiment and we were looked for it. Well, Alpha Company and Charlie Company flew in on the same LZ and choppers started getting shot down as fast as we was coming in. What we didn't know was we jumped right in the middle of their base camp. And we made it that night. The next day they sent out two platoons, one from each company. And second platoon, which I was in, had to take part of it. And we went out into the jungle and we we actually found North Vietnamese that was sick from malaria, other diseases, and we brought them back. And as we was bringing them back in that night, mortar rounds started. And I, I don't know the official report, but they said it was something like over 400 rounds fired at us, and all but 36 of them landed with the inside of the company area. Uh, a lot of fire. Yeah. 105s were running low on ammo, and they tried to bring it in on the Chinook. Chinook was taking fire. He had to drop it because it was in a, um, he was bringing it in on a sling under him. And as he dropped it and turned away, he was shot down, and they died. Uh, later, a rocket propelled grenade hit the 105 rounds, and they all exploded. Uh, it, it, was, it was a bad time. Uh, we lost quite a few helicopters, and we lost a lot of good men. And we had Puff the Magic Dragon all night long firing around us. We had F-4 Phantoms. Uh, artillery, it was just a, uh, it was an uns. It, even when we left, we were drawing fire. So there was days you'd go weeks sometime with nothing except boredom, and then in a split second, uh, you were fighting for your life. The enemy usually picked the time and where they were going to fight. An um, infantry company could not move through the jungle quietly. <laughs> so from the time you moved, they knew exactly where you were. That evening when they brought in ammo and all the other stuff to you about helicopter, they knew where you were. So usually they picked the spot to do their fighting. And uh, where with the alerts, we always tried to pick the spot. And we... We try to use the element of surprise. The element of surprise can get you a long ways. 
we had one team that walked into a base camp, North Vietnamese base camp. There were only five of them. <laughs> it surprised the North Vietnamese. It surprised the Lurps. <laughs> Lots of surprise. Now, the Lurps, what did they do? They charged, shooting everything. The enemy thought they were really being overrun and took out the... <laughs> they captured the officer that That's was in incredible. charge. It's incredible. It was, it was the biggest, it's what you call st stepping in a pile of it, coming out <laughs> smelling like a rose. Well, that team did. Without a wound, it was if <laughs> then you had days like that, and then you had days of this. Night. But instead of running, they just attacked, and the element of surprise is what did it. How, how much how much latitude did they give you guys? Because you know the Lerps, you know they were a lot of them, at least in the pictures, are wearing tiger stripe camouflage. Well, that that the tiger from <clears throat> we we wasn't issued that. Yeah. If we had that, we bought it ourselves. Uh, they issued the regular jungle fatigues. Um, we had it, like when they give me a mission, they would give me a mission like um, eight grid squares. Each grid square is a thousand meter square up. Maybe eight or ten to the right. So we had this whole area. And how I operated in that area was up to me. I was a team leader. Then we'd get the intelligence report. Now, usually that wasn't worth listening to. <laughs> and it wasn't because they didn't get good information. It's because they sat on it too long yeah. before they operate. I mean, if you got good information, use it. If you set three months on it, it's, it, it's not that good. Mm -hmm. uh, if we got a chance, any team leader, if he got a chance, he would go up the day before you go out and he'd try to do an aerial recon of that area. Now, he didn't just do that area, he'd do a bunch of other areas, so he didn't let the enemy know that he was just... We would pick two to three LZs, and the primary one we was going to land in, and <clears throat> then he'd come back and he would brief his men on the intelligence, they get all their equipment, they get food, they get water, they get the morphine, everything that goes with it. Every man carried uh, uh, medical and we'd sit down and we'd discuss what we'd seen. Now a lot of times we didn't have that much time. We'd get the report, they didn't get, wasn't able to get out and check it. We'd find out when we got there. 90% uh, of the times or more we went in by helicopter. Sometimes what we would do was fly into an infantry company. We'd spend the night with them in the jungle, and then when they move out, going on patrol, we'd go the other direction into the area. Now, the area we was given, nobody was allowed to go in it while we were in there. Uh, for our safety and theirs. Um, so there was a lot of, we didn't know, you had to find out. Uh, the maps we used, uh, some of them were good, some of them wasn't so good. The trails, you get under a triple canopy jungle, you could not see the sky. There you, there'd be massive trails, and you try to draw these on the map so you could fill in a battalion or brigade when you get back. Because when we got back, we always got debriefed. Uh, we tried to work, if we were working in a battalion area, we tried to work with that battalion uh, and let them know what we found before we go back to brigade. Uh, it wasn't just the brigade frequency. Each man had to know brigade frequency, the battalion frequency. They had to know the artillery. They had to know the um, Air Force back. Uh, every man had to know these uh, frequencies by heart, not just the radio operator. Uh, we were in the jungle several times where they would change frequencies, the whole unit would, without telling us. <laughs> You'd call in and nobody would answer. The first time we happened, we were wondering if the war was over and no one told us. <laughs> and 
Later that day, one little Air Force plane came flying over, and he got on our frequency, and he got us, and he said he had to be able to spot us from the air. So we got an area where he could see us. He said he had an item he was going to drop to us, and he did. It turned out it was all the new frequencies and everything. <laughs> they were actually listening to us, and if we had gotten contact, they would have gone ahead, and, but they weren't mm -hmm. supposed to transmit mm -hmm. otherwise. Uh, that was the first time we'd run into that. Afterwards, we kind of figured what happened. Uh, there's all, all kinds of little things you ran into. Uh, the jungle is very unfriendly. Uh, from the termites on the ground to the leeches, uh, the massive ants and bugs that would eat you, uh, snakes, uh, they had so many snakes. You try to walk through the jungle being quiet, looking for the enemy, and you'd have 30 monkeys up in the tree throwing sticks at you hour. Uh, How did y'all deal with the bugs? <laughs> You just had to live with it. Uh, that's all, all you had to do is every couple hours you do what they call a leech check. You take and strip off your clothes and get the leeches off of you. And mosquitoes was 24 hours a day. Uh, leeches were too. The termites, huge termites, they would come out at night. First time I heard them I actually thought there was someone marching through the jungle. And what it was is these billions of, they're taking their clickers and clicking it. It was the weirdest thing you think somebody's moving through the jungle. Uh, they had cobras, banded crates, uh, bamboo vipers. They had more snakes than you know what to do with. Uh, they had wild elephants, uh, tigers. I always wondered what it would be like if a tiger attacked you to shoot him with a little six, M16. Fortunately, I never had to find out. <laughs> How would you guys sleep at night? Uh, well, if there was four or five of you, you slept back to back. You used your rucksack as your pillow. <clears throat> uh, you had one little, uh, what they, they call a poncho liner blanket, very light. Uh, one guy would stay awake, everybody go to sleep, and you'd be, you were on duty two hours, then you wake the next guy up, he was on duty for two hours, and the next guy, and the next guy. That's the only way you get enough sleep and move all day through the jungle. Yeah. Um, monsoon season would be so wet that you would sleep in the water. There, you were wet from the time you got on the chopper till you got back on it five, six days later, come back in. And you would, sometimes you'd sleep setting up against your pack in a tree because the water would be running over your legs. And it would be raining 24 hours a day. And you were, you were uh, it's hard to think of having, uh, being so cold with the, uh, Thermia, uh, hypothermia. hypothermia, but in Vietnam it can happen when it rains like that, 24 hours a day, you can get hypothermia. Pulls all your body heat out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but a lot of times what we did was just went out there and watched the enemy move and called it in. I found small ammo cache shades, I found huge, uh, base camps and bunker complexes. Uh, I, when I first got over there, I, I, I did a little bit of the tunnel wrap for a while, but I was uh, tall and skinny. That was something uh, nobody wanted to do. Uh, usually it went to the shortest guy, whether he liked it or not. Mm -hmm. um, what, what was that like going down one of those tunnels? Uh, you tie a rope to your leg, and that was your lifeline. If you got shot, they could pull you out, dead or alive. Um, when we first started, we had a flashlight and a 45. And later, they found out the 45 almost busted eardrums in there. 
So we got this high standard 22, which SOG actually used a lot of them too, but they used them with uh, suppressors on theirs. And we take those in. Uh, you never crawl far forward very long. Their tunnels kept bending. And you never was able to look long distance and see. They had traps in some of them. Uh, some of them we found, you would find old medical there where they slept, their, their uh, eating areas, their hospital areas. It stunk, oh my God, it stunk like rotten animals in there because they'd do surgery and everything and the infection that they'd have. Um, you'd find snakes in there that come, went in there. Uh, some of them were massive. I mean, they were like cities. Uh, one story on top of the other and gone uh, way back. And these were dug all the way back from World War II. Uh, they had World War II and then they had uh, the French and then this. A lot of them was dug during then. Um, they had uh, booby traps you could run into. The last one I crawled into, or started to crawl into, I came and uh, I was checking the we found it right next to a riverbed where it went under and I was crawling in and I was checking and I found a Russian made uh, mine. And I took and disarmed the mine, moved it out of the way and started crawling again. I found another mine. <laughs> and I disarmed it, took it out of the way and told the lieutenant it's getting awful dangerous around here. <laughs> now you gotta remember, I was just an E3 e then. Prop. And I found my third mine. And I told the lieutenant I wasn't going in that mine. I wasn't going in that tunnel. And he said, well, it only makes sense if they mined it like that. There's something in there we should know about. And I told him, I hope he finds it. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going in there. I didn't. <laughs> I don't think anybody so, blamed you. <laughs> so what we did is we blew the tunnel up. Yeah. I thought that was a smart thing to do. But, uh, we, had, we had some really good officers. Mm. Uh, overall, I would say I was very fortunate to have some very outstanding officers. Some of them I didn't think too highly of, but as far as doing their job and knowing what they were doing, they were good at it. And that's all I really cared about. I didn't care if I liked them a whole lot. And really it wasn't my job to like them a lot. Uh, and <clears throat> I didn't have the pressure on me that they had, so I really didn't understand. Sometimes they had to answer someone higher. Right. And um, later as I matured uh, more, I, I started understanding where they were coming from and what was happening. Uh, as far as that go, I didn't like every uh, enlisted man I ever served with either. Uh, but overall, we had some very good officers. So it's, it's my understanding that um, eventually the LERPs would get absorbed into the Rangers. It did. Were, were you there when that that transition took place? And Actually, what was that like? um, I had gotten out of the service for 11 months and then went back in. And it happened during that time. In 1969, the LERPs went from LERPs, we went to the Rangers. Um, the LERPs in the 4th Division became um, <clears throat> K Company 75th Rangers. When I went back to Vietnam with the 1st Cav, I went with H Company 75th Rangers. 1st uh, Cav had two companies, E Company and H. and um, we didn't have the training that you go through uh, Fort Benny Ranger School, but we had on-the-job training in Vietnam. <laughs> uh, when I first went into LERPs, a lot of the guys were sent to a recondo school. I was never sent there as an E6. I was expected to know it, even though I was so young. And the Reconda School did real good. Uh, 
Later we started having our own classes in artillery, map reading, first aid, and uh, communication. When a team went out, when they came back in, usually when they came in and got off the helicopter, first thing they were handed was a cold beer. They would drop off their equipment and then they'd get debriefed. Now the only thing I did not like about the debriefing is a lot of times we were told that we were basically lying. This couldn't happen and you make it back. Uh, you couldn't have seen that without them seeing you. On one occasion I had a company commander come into brigade in front of the brigade commander and tell the brigade commander that I was lying on my report. Huh. That his unit had been there for three weeks in that area and they had never found the base camp. And he was right. His unit had been there for three weeks. They were an armor unit with the armor uh, infantry. And they had tanks and APCs. Well, a tank and APC can only go some places. They can't go down in deep ravines and through swampy areas. And the infantry they had didn't get very far away from their tanks and their APCs. They sent us in and we ran across all their tracks. Yeah. But we went down into this one uh, real swampy area, ravine, and we ran into a base camp and we got chased out. So I told him, that I would go back if he would bring a platoon to go with us. And there's a write-up in the pa uh, paper uh, over there about it. Went back in, platoon and us, ran into that base camp and got the hell knocked out of us. And we fought our way back out and when we got back to brigade, I'll have to say the officer earned my respect. He took me in front of the uh, brigade commander and told the brigade commander that he was wrong and that I was right and I had not lied or fudged on that report at all. And he earned my respect on that. <clears throat> but a lot of times when we would come in, we'd be in a firefight and everybody put their life on the line out there, come back in and have someone in intelligence say, that's not true. That's that's so ridiculous. That that was that is that was really the hardest thing on us. See, the hardest thing on the guys in Nam was that we knew at any time we could win that war. And the political party in the United States, and even some of the military leaders, didn't want us to win that war. Well, sir. I empathize with you because as an Afghanistan veteran, I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> I mean, it was, and the only ground we ever owned was what you're standing on at that time. Several times I would fight from the exact same location I would fought from a month before to take that exact location from the enemy and do it again. <laughs> Pack up, leave it, and come back and do it again. It made no sense. Yeah. You think they learned because we did the same thing in Afghanistan on more than one occasion. <laughs> and the only thing difference is we had free fire zones. And where we always worked, it was a free fire zone. There was no villages, there was not supposed to be any uh, innocents in that area. Uh, you didn't have to wait on them to shoot first. Uh, as soon as you saw them, you could shoot them. Now, we made it a point. We did not shoot children or women. Now, she had a gun, that, that was her part. But we didn't go out to hurt the innocent people. But I really can't say that we've only ran into a few innocent people the whole time we were out there. And they were being used basically as slaves to carry ammunition and stuff for the North Vietnamese. Anything specific you want to? Um, I'm I'm just curious um, from your perspective since you since when you went back the second time you were part of the Rangers. Um, my understanding is you guys operated in bigger units. No, well we ha we had more people, but we operated 
still in four or five man teams. Okay. Uh, there was just more of you. When I first got into the LERPs, we didn't have a lot of team leaders. So you'd go out for five, six days, come back in, your team would get to stand down for two or three days to get rested up, yeah. and they needed it. That team leader might go out again with the next day with another team for five or six days and come back in and do it again. You'd almost get burnt out because you'd get no mm -hmm. downtime. Right. When you were the Rangers, you had more people, so they didn't you didn't have you to. Had, yeah, you had two companies where when mm -hmm. I was the second brigade lurch, <clears throat> we had one platoon. Mm -hmm. And we were expected to keep so many teams out at all times. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> the more people we got in, it was a little bit easier. But a lot of times you'd go out, I had a, every team had people that uh, that they preferred, that was their team. But now one of them might be sick, one of them might be on R&R, &R or different things. So then you'd have one or two men not uh, missing. So then you'd get somebody from another team that was back in the back uh, fill in for you. Which was no big thing because we all worked mm -hmm. together anyhow, trained together. When you came in, you got first day you got off, you got debriefed, you got your weapon clean, you got some hot chow, and you got a couple of cold beers. The next day, we'd go down to the fire line and we'd fire our weapons, make sure everything worked, you could hit what you're shooting at, and we would actually practice ambushes and stuff uh, to keep everybody on their toes. Or we would <clears throat> sit and we'd have somebody call in a uh, mortar fire out, out in the field or something, or artillery, or uh, work through calling in an airstrike. The first time they told me to uh, identify myself at night and we had these strobe lights. One of the guys turned it on and stuck it in the air. Well, he found out quick, that ain't what you do. <laughs> <laughs> Enemy shoots at them strobe lights. He <laughs> uh, stuck it to a stick and stuck it in the air. It worked better. And that's how Puff the Magic Dragon and the Four Phantoms know not to hit us. We practice with McGuire rigs, flying out on McGuire rigs. We practice with uh, the SOG units used uh, ladders, hanging out the helicopters and stuff a lot. We, I'd actually practice with the ladders, but I never used them at, uh, under uh, in combat. Later, I did use the McGuire rigs. Can, can you explain? What that a wire rig is a rope that's hanging about 200 feet below the helicopter. And in the rope, it has a D-ring attached to it. And it has this um, seat. It's like a swing. And what you do is that what we call a Swiss, they have them made now, but what they call a Swiss seat, uh, you tie ropes around you, and you had to make sure the knot was right or it'd pull out and then you'd hook a D-ring in it. And they had dropped these um, McGuire rigs with sandbags to get them through the trees. You take the sandbag out, you stick the seat under your butt, and you take your D-ring and hook into that D-ring, and that chopper would pull you straight up while he's getting shot at, and then take off and fly until you can fly safely and land you. And that's how you came out, and at night, that's an ex any time, that's extremely dangerous. And at night, it's even worse. Now, if he took off too quick, he would drag you through the trees, could bring down the helicopter, or he could break you. And it's nothing more, it, it, it is pure nightmare when you have to use one. I imagine they're shooting at you and the helicopter. Well, they're both. shooting. They want to bring that helicopter down. If they bring mm -hmm. it down, they know you're not going nowhere. Right. It's that quick. And when you're under there flying off, if that copter does go down, the only thing you can do is go with it. Because <laughs> you're tied to it. Yeah. And when we practice with them, a lot of times they would practice with new. Uh, Warrant officers coming in from the states, and you'd have somebody that knew how to do it, and someone who didn't, because there's a trick to stop them. 
when you're coming in, if you flare too quick, you'll throw that guy right up, and it looks like he's going right into the uh, rotor blades. Road blades. Mm. And it, it, you really like to know the guy that's going to do it. Yeah. Did y'all ever use the ones where multiple guys could clip into the rope at the same time, nope. or always just single? Nope. Always single. They always have a rope for each one of us. And the only time I got in trouble was when I was training with McGuire Riggs. And I was really, they had had several people in a different division that had died because they tied the rope wrong. And when they got up in the air, it came loose and they fell out. Mm. And I was really subconsciously and consciously tunnel vision on safety on that rope that I overlooked some other things. And my men did everything right. And we were going up together. And I told them, if you get scared, we all hold hands. Not that it'd do you any good, but <laughs> we all hold hands. And they, the chopper flew over, he dropped the sandbags just like they were supposed to, go through the drill. Everybody go over there, get the sandbag off theirs, put the seat under them, hook into the D-ring. I did the same thing. But what I didn't recognize is they put the D-ring too high up. And when the chopper took off, the seat fell out from under me. And I was being held by the rope under my arms. It felt like a razor blade cutting through me and it just kept coming and coming. Actually, it could have pulled my arm joints out and I could have fell. But the men saw I was in trouble and they grabbed a hold of me and we always had someone in the chopper and that was his primary job was to watch and he spotted it so we only got up to about 500 feet and the chopper brought us back down but I was so thinking about the other guys hooking up I didn't look and it was a mistake by whoever made it up but it was also a mistake on my part and there was no rush I could have took it easier, gone through it. I made a mistake and almost cost me my life. It's amazing how something that simple. Yep. Can, but I had the seat under me. There was a DV. That's what I'm supposed to hook into. And I did one. I did A to B, and A fell out from under me. I mean, that's that's a common common thing with leaders. Yep. Is you're you're so focused on your men and making sure your men are squared away that you kind of overlook yourself mm -hmm. and, and, and you and we had to go through mm -hmm. demolitions we learned uh, C4 debt cord uh, we that was our primary demolition we did use a little bit of uh, dynamite and uh, TNT when I was in the line company but mostly we did uh, uh, C4 and debt cord everybody would carry four two pound blocks of C4, <clears throat> and that was partially for hit cooking our food, but mostly it was also for blowing things up. Sp speaking of food, what kind of food would you take out on the, on the missions? Okay, and an alert mission, they had they just came out with what they called a dehydrated. It was a um, they called them lurp, uh, lurp rations, and it was packages something like the MR MR series now. Um, <clears throat> you would heat up thing of uh, water up and then you would pour it into the pack and, and wait five minutes and eat it. We had spaghetti, chili con carne, we had uh, beef and rice, uh, scalloped potatoes, uh, different things and they were a lot better, they were, they were what everybody wanted. <laughs> uh, the infantry was getting sea rashes that was made in 1945. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for eight months, I ate those things. Uh, Not cuisine dining? No. <laughs> uh, you could use the pork or the beef patties for hockey putts. Uh, about the best thing they really had was either the um, fruit or the uh, lima beans and ham. I mean, it, it, they were terrible rations. 
and they even came up with a cookbook for sea rations in Vietnam, some, some GI made. So he was always trying to doctor it up or do something. They were terrible. <laughs> they had cigarettes in them that was, well, they were put there in 1945 and we were 1966 or 67. They were 20 plus years yeah. old. Mm. I, I'd imagine the grunts didn't care though. No. Well, they did care, but that's all they had to eat. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and on my alert team, I tried mm. to pick men that did not smoke. Because smoking in the jungle, uh, even if they don't see it, you can smell it right. for a long ways. And somebody that's a heavy chain smoker going five or six days without a cigarette, mm. uh, you just didn't want that irritation out there with your men. Would some guy, the, the smokers, would they try to do that out in the jungle? Not on a lip merchant, because if they ever got caught once, they were off the team, and they'd go back to them. Uh, line companies, they'd do it all the time. They'd try to light one up in the middle of the night. Even if they didn't, nobody saw it, you could smell it. Right. It's amazing how something like that could travel through the jungle with all the other smells that would well, be there. But when I was with Charlie Company, a lot of times when you were fixing to get attacked because we could smell the enemy mm -hmm. before we could hear them. <clears throat> because you'd have hundreds of guys moving towards you and you were downwind from them and they spent all their time around campfires cooking uh, fish heads and stuff like that. It, it it was just embedded into them, mm -hmm. and you would. And it sounds, it sounds uh, like it's not true, but buzz. You could actually smell them before you could hear them. Wow. Yes, uh, it was it was quite a while. There. But I I ran into a lot of people. Uh, I'm still in contact with some of them today. A lot of the guys I served with are starting to pass away now. Uh, my radio operators in uh, Tennessee, uh, Jack McFarland was one of my men. He's in uh, Washington State. Uh, I try to keep in contact with them. Our sniper that we had, uh, Ron Kuhn, had passed away about a year, and maybe two years ago, with cancer. Uh, so Doug Flowers, which is uh, a story all in himself. Uh, great guy. Uh, he worked as my, either my uh, point man or my radio operator. I did most of my own point myself. Now if I had someone I really thought was good on point, I let them have it. But if I didn't, I worked my own point, which wasn't a big... Uh, the brass didn't like it. They thought I should be in the middle. Well, you only got four or five men middle and ain't that far from the point anyhow. <laughs> Doesn't make a big yeah. difference. If you take fire, you ain't far enough away for it yeah. matters. <laughs> it ain't like a line company. But uh, they, these men were really overachievers. When we had a, well, we try to have a party once in a while, we got enough guys back at base camp at the same time. We always invited the helicopter pilots that were there and their door gunners. Because <clears throat> they always would come in no matter what happened and they'd get shot all up, yep. pull us out. Those are the guys you wanted to be on good terms with. <laughs> well, when I go back to base camp, I didn't go to the <clears throat> uh, brigade area. I would go over to the airfield and whichever pilots were out at the four fire bases that night, I'd sleep in their bunk. And when they were out at our fire base, if I was out in the field, they would sleep in my bunk. I'd drink their booze, they'd drink mine. They usually <laughs> had better booze. Well, I guess we get, uh, and let me just say, sir, I, I really appreciate your time sitting down. And yeah, Unfortunately, your, your generation is starting to, starting to die we're, off. And we're World War II, isn't it? We're, we're yeah. starting to die off. Um, <clears throat> I knew a bunch of guys that never got a medal at all. I tell everybody, medals is not the way to judge somebody. 100%. Uh, it's nice to have medals. But a lot of guys out there did wonderful things, great things. They, they really, 
and no one saw it, or yeah. if they did see it, they were so busy afterwards that something else took, and they never wrote them up. Uh, so when somebody <clears throat> says, well, he's got a bronze star, and that guy ain't got nothing, well, that guy out there with nothing may be a better soldier. 100%. And it's, you know, the leadership has to, has to take the responsibility and, and put in the work and to recognize those guys. And I'm a, I'm a firm firm proponent of, you know, awarding Marines and, you know, my Marines, you know, rewarding their, their, their actions because it just, it installs uh, motivation, it installs esprit, esprit de corps. Well, if, if the division commander said you get a Silver Star, you got it. Brigade commanders say it, you got it. Yeah. Battalion commanders say you got it. Now, if you're a company commander or a platoon leader, yeah, you probably get it. But if you was written up by the men that were out there with you, then it went before a review officer, <clears> and he would read it. Well, now that may not, that don't sound like that to serve a silver star to me. We'll give him an army accommodation. <laughs> so you can't always go by medals. I know a lot of guys that should have really got some decent medals and never got anything. <clears throat> I just, I mean, just sitting here listening to some of your stories, I mean, it's just, it's incredible that. But I got, yeah, that, I had some incredible people I worked with, and uh, I really loved, and those men were my family. Matter of fact, they were closer to my own brothers. <clears throat> because our lives depended on each other. Yeah. That's about it, really. Well, that's amazing. Can you uh, just, for the audience's sake, can you just tell us when when you got back what your reception was and what did you end up doing in, in life after after the war? Well, when I got back, the first thing they did, and it was probably the worst thing they could have done, is they made me in charge of military funerals. Ugh. And I'd seen enough. And we traveled all over the Northwest doing military funerals, and I always tried to make sure that we did the best job we could. But it was probably the hardest thing I had to do after I got back. And then I, I, I started having a lot of nightmares. I started having a lot of uh, I started questioning myself about things, decisions I'd made that had caused people to die, whether I did this right or if I didn't do it right. And it's actually the worst thing you can do because you cannot go back and change anything. And at the time, at that particular time, you had seconds to make a decision where Someone that when you get back in base camp and they're debriefing you, they can sit back there and question you all they want. Uh, I lost men in Vietnam and that bothered me. And it, it also affected my leadership as an NCO. I went through the NCO academies and passed them and I went through all these things, but I was having uh, <clears throat> I just had too many problems. I ran into a lot of NCOs, like I said, resented that I was so young. I ran into officers, especially second lieutenants, that resented that I was so young, which at that time I was probably <clears throat> older than they were, and they were second lieutenants. And they hadn't had any military train, uh, combat training. <laughs> But they, they sort of fed off what the NCOs said. And I let that affect me far more than it should have. And it finally affected me enough that uh, I got out of service. I have no hard feelings service. I'm, uh, I'm grateful for my time there. I'm glad I was able to serve my country. What year did you end up leaving the, the service? Uh, when I got back? Yeah, when you transitioned out of the Army? Uh, where was that? I went to back to Fort Lewis. Uh, 
trying to figure the unit that was there at that time. Uh, it was an armor unit, but we didn't have any armor. Our tanks were all in Europe in case of the Russians ever decided to hit Europe. <clears throat> and um, then I went, uh, I went from there to a DI school, and then I went from there to uh, 3rd Infantry Division in Germany. I was at uh, Schaffenburg, Germany, with an armor unit there. We had M60s and uh, 113s, and then I got out of service. What year was that? That was uh, 71 and 72. Mm -hmm. So I was right at the end. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what would you end up doing after the military? After military, uh, I did a lot of things. Um, I went into law enforcement for a number of years. I was a <clears throat> plumber and electrician. I worked as a uh, security guard for a while. Um, I actually worked uh, with and I knew the Hillside Strangler that killed all those women up in Washington State. Uh, I was a dairy farmer. Uh, my family wound up having my own business, uh, air conditioning and electrician, and appliance repair. And then I retired. I actually enjoyed working where I didn't work around a lot of people. Uh, and I still like it when I'm not around. <laughs> <laughs> See, I come by it honestly. <laughs> So, but I did different things. Uh, law enforcement, I think, is one of the most satisfying, but also uh, one of the hardest jobs a person can have, uh, especially nowadays, where they have very little backing and they get thrown under the bus by every liberal league mayor and <laughs> city councilman they run into. It's a uh, it's hard on the officer, it's hard on their families, and then you get people that don't support them. Now you have people that shouldn't be police officers. You have people that shouldn't be president, congressman, or any other job too. You have the good and the bad. Most of them are very good at what they do and they're very honest at what they do. Uh, but it seems like the press always keeps the bad ones Well, they have, an, uh, they have an agenda. Yep, they have an agenda, and it doesn't exactly mean telling the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. Who is it said that uh, a lie will make it around the world multiple times before the, the truth, truth makes it, it once? Yeah. Is it I, Churchill? I can't remember. I can't remember who it was, but I know what you're talking about. So, Well, sir, this has been a fantastic interview, and I really appreciate you sitting down with us. Well, thank you. It was good meeting you. So I, I, I don't think I've ever sat down and talked to Alert before, not even in like an interview setting or anything along those lines. So, I mean, this has just been amazing. Well, so. one of my guys wrote a book about the LERPs uh, called LLRP, The Professionals, by Frank Camper. Uh, I knew Frank. He was there when I was there. Uh, he also wrote a book about mercenaries. Uh, he went into uh, trying to start up a mercenary group. Uh, that, That's what we need to do. <laughs> that actually uh, wasn't very good for him. No. Uh, uh, Did they, they go to Rhodesia? Huh? Did they go to Rhodesia? Well, uh, some of the people he trained went and did some things they shouldn't have, and it came back to him, mm. which also brought the feds back on top of him. Oh, uh, okay. See, the military can train you to do something and you go in civilian life and you do it, it they don't hang the military. They may make the look military or look a little bad, but you as a private citizen train somebody to do it and they come back, it comes back on them. Gotcha. And in reality, he shouldn't have done what he did. He shouldn't have trained the people he did. 
Well, the old saying, shit happens. Yeah, I saw him on <laughs> 60 Minutes one time. That's not usually a good thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's life. Yeah. All right, sir. I greatly appreciate you. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you guys. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, Staff Sergeant, salute you. Okay, thank you.